Good morning, everyone else. Uh, I think everyone else who's joining us so far is in the US. So welcome. Good morning. Good evening. Um, so I'm going to start by just introducing Anand quickly for those of you who don't know him. Um, Anand is a Mongolian investigative journalist. He has bylines in ProPublica, AFP, Foreign Policy, Reuters, the South China, Mor South China Morning Post, and Business Insider. And uh, he first he first recently got got his first producer credit on Netflix um, for an interesting and um, actually the the way that I got to know Anand um, is because he is a feminist activist and so I got to meet him through those circles in Mongolia as well um, and it's now a book it's available for purchase on Amazon um, I'm working with Internom to get copies um, in UV so that people can buy it in Mongolia. Um, and one thing um, I want to say as we get started is uh, just want to give you a disclaimer that we were filming this so that we can put it on YouTube after for people. I, I will take it as your uh, tacit consent that you, you agree to have your, your question filmed. So today um, I want to talk with Anand about um, presented in world media the risks of the go with being an investigative journalist in Mongolia. And then I want to get a little bit, a bit in depth um, with my third question here. I want to talk to him about um, what goes into a, a passage from the book here. So while many journalists and media activists are hard at work on improving Mongolia's media landscape domestically, others are focused on improving Mongolia's rep and world media is an understatement. In the New York Times archive, which dates back to 1851 and holds more than 13 million articles, there are mere 9,004 articles. What's telling is that there are about 2,000 more articles that mention Chinggis Khan, uh, using the search term Genghis Khan, than there are articles that mention his country of origin, so, who studies international news flows would classify as an invisible country. In data that he collected on Western international news coverage from 2008 to 2015, Mongolia is one of the leading covered countries. In looking at mentions of countries in American television over the last six years, Kala Vitaro, the data scientist behind the global database of events, language, and tone of American media, GDELT's data-coded map of world media mentions is nearly identical to a data-coded map of the countries Americans search for using Google. Mongolia is ra rarely searched for. While the map similarity can only show us correlation, not causation, it seems fair to infer that more stories about a country generate more curiosity about it. This is borne out by, by looking at what Mongolia-related things the, word searches, the, wor the world searches for using Google. The top search term from most of the Grand Tour, a British television show that filmed three men crossing Mongolia using an offer a vehicle called an ovo, an altar made from, the heap, from heaps of stone and wood. The top search term since Google started collecting the data 16 years ago is Mongolian barbecue. Ironically, Mongolia's absence from world media is in part because it's a hard country on which to research and report. Getting there requires a long and expensive journey, and some of those flights only run a few days per week. Flying into the city during the long winter months can be risky. Flights are regularly canceled due to weather conditions, which include the smog of pollution being too thick for pilots to safely land planes. And of course, there's the Mongolian language. The U.S. Foreign Service ranks Mongolian as one of the most difficult languages in the world, taking more than 1,100 hours to learn. Mongolia stands out against other challenging languages. Contrastingly, there are scarce resources available to learn Mongolian. There's no Duolingo, there's no Rosetta Stone, there's certainly no Mongolian subtitles option, even advanced enough to decipher a children's book. I've personally studied Russian, Spanish, French, Italian, Azari, and even Ancient Greek, but Mongolian nearly broke me. After months of taking six hours of lessons per day, five days per week, and traveling to and from and living in Mongolia, I can speak intelligibly about little more than my dogs and food preferences. Mongolian journal journalist Halyun Bayersok says that she finds the stories produced by flyby journalism, when journalists drop in for seven to ten days and write a series of stories on herders and mining. I want the world to know about the other challenges we're facing, she says. These visiting journalists nearly always cover the same topics, and they sometimes make key errors in understanding or reporting incorrect facts. So Holly Yoon and her husband, fellow journalist Anand Tumurtogo, have found their niche, using their English language skills to write about Mongolia for foreign media outlets. Their goal is to cover stories that foreign reporters don't report on, either because foreign that are physically too difficult to reach just on a short trip. They hope to tell the stories of marginalized people who don't often gain the attention of the mainstream press. 
So that was, that was the longest passage that I'll read to you today. But now I want to turn to Anand and ask him um, about Mongolia that are making it into international press, both historically and, you know, recently, and which, you know, what's being reported on Mongolia right now, and whether perhaps you notice any broadening of the topics that are... You're cutting out a little bit, but I, I think I, I got the question. So the one of the things that I see most of the times is uh, foreign journalists very focused on the majestic side of, of Mongolia, uh, like the eagle hunters or the, or the reindeer uh, herders. Those are the main uh, things that would foreign journalists would pick up on. And just recently, there was just one story on CNN that was about an eagle hunter, like a very handsome eagle hunter. And, and, it's, and it's quite fascinating to me is that that story was just a, basically another rip off of another story last year by, by Vice. And, and those stories seem to get regurgitated over and over again. And also people who travel to, uh, to the nor northern part of Mongolia uh, um, to see the rain, reindeer herders. And they talk about how their journeys are so arduous and difficult. And they find that people who live there is so fascinating and so majestic and all that. And I think those those are the main stories that foreigners are mainly focused on, and uh, I think that speaks to of how the, the foreign side, the the West, wants to see Mongolia. Uh, that's something that's very pristine, that untouched, and uh, that's very, that nobody really goes there. And we're uh, very like in tune with our nature or our old way of lives and some some of it's true but most of the time uh, what happens is that those people who go there actually make those realities themselves and uh, they basically distort some truths to those like the eagle hunters um the few people few kazakh people have have told me that uh that the hunting traditional is not really a thing within them and just uh, they start to pick up because more people, like more foreigners, were interested in seeing the eagle hunters. So more and more Kazakh people uh, took up that tradition. And and you, you probably know the uh, the, the movie uh, of the um, uh, Ash, uh, of the girl, the eagle hunters girl. Ashokan. Yes, and th there was a really good article. I think what, what was it? I, I forgot, but. Uh, this one journalist who who points out that uh, that documentary was basically not true that Ashil Pan was not the first female eagle huntress and and during that time there, she was not really there weren't other girls weren't like like forsaken to hunt or anything like that uh, that person just wanted to portray something that wasn't true and just made it seem as though women were were like were like exiled or forbidden to do hunting at all but that wasn't not the case at all but he wanted to show that kind of a message and and it might have actually distorted some of the things that people see about mongolia and yeah those are the things that, that usually foreigners tend to look at and i think and the broadening of of topics is currently the the issue of inner Mongolians, ethnic Mongolians. That, that that's a very hot topic. And um, aside, aside from that, um, mostly it's been the eagle hunters, the the northern herders, and um, mining and economy basically. Not 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 much everything else. It's just all those all those small things in there, like how Mongolia is a very majestic country and how it's vast and how it's free. And like in your book, like where the, the, the wild east, as you say. Turning here to the next passage, um, I wanna get more into Anand's career as a journalist. recently, having started his career as an English teacher. When teaching, he would inspire his students by telling them that learning English is the key to accessing the world. He'd tell his classes about other Asian authors in China and Japan to the world. 
I would tell them that there's basically no person like that in Mongolia and that they could be that person, Anand says. I kept telling them about these things and one of my students said, why don't you do it, teacher? I was taken aback and thought, why don't I do it? That got me thinking and I wanted to pursue it. The spark that finally convinced Anand to leave teaching and strike out as a journalist was learning about South Korean journalists for revealing through extensive investigative research the long buried secret of how American soldiers massacred civilians at the No Gun Reed Bridge in the Korean War. Cho had worked with two non Korean journalists, Charles J. Haney, Hanley and Martha Mendoza, to unearth the story. In his local investigation, describing Cho, Anand says, He's a journalist who understands the West and who also understands his own culture. He can combine them and give them give that to the world. That's a very valuable thing. Not to downplay the work of former journalists stayed in that country for a number of years. Anand, bash feature him in this book, regularly makes a point of telling me that he's not Mongolia's best journalist. My advantage is that I have a good grasp of the English language. There are far better Mongolian journalists out there than me that would ask better questions, that would find the nuance of the situation far better than I could, but they're operating in a bubble. If they had some foreign language, downplaying the quality of his own work and the courage that it has taken to file back to taken to file the stories that he has. In the spring of 2019, an unpublished back-to-back -back articles calling out high-level corruption and abuses of power. Well, judiciary had been discussed domestically. It was Anand who first alerted the rest of the world to the Mongolian leader's soft coup by reporting about it in foreign policy. Just weeks later, he published a lengthy investigative piece with co-author Ian McDougall in ProPublica. The story revealed that in 2010, elite global consulting firm McKinsey had been unofficially barred from Mongolia after it had signed a consulting agreement with an advisor who was also a government entity, meaning that if McKinsey won the contract, this government advisor would personally benefit winning a piece of the same contract for his own involved in this dubious deal. The country's former transportation minister, the ex-director of the state-owned railway, railway company, and the government advisor. The prosecutors alleged that three men had used their positions to illegally the, con the contract toward McKinsey's bid, while in the process increasing the contract value to $1.65 million more than McKinsey had even asked for, a clear sign of a case The three in 2017, the third was elected president. Upon taking office, President Batulka welcomed McKinsey back into Mongolia. When I told myself, I wouldn't write about politics. That's very dangerous, and you shouldn't write about those things, says Anand, who clearly has had a change of heart. There was a moment when I wor was worried a little bit, but I thought if repercussions that his reporting may bring. His wife disagrees. Of course we worry, she explains. I was very worried when he was working on the ProPublica Pro, Pro piece, but same time, very, very worried. Sorry, she said she was very happy when he was working on it, but also very worried. Writing stories about Mongolian scandals and corruption in international news outlets generates mixed reactions at home. In addition to receiving accusations that he's being against political opponents, an honor of their country to be from stories that make it look bad. On the other hand, by reporting these stories in the international press, Anand is both giving domestic journalists covered in feasance. Hopefully more Mongolians will report on Mongolia to the world. Even though our country is so small and our economy is not that big, we have to talk about it to an international audience. He's international audience what you are doing and people will question your moves and your ethics. So those who, have, who, who know Mongolia who have been following this reading series know that Mongolia is a democracy but that, that it's a democracy that's currently under threat. Anand, can you tell us what risks there are in reporting the kind of stories that you do and how you weigh those risks um, and then what specific sort of things do you worry about 
Mongolia's anti-defamation laws, more serious bodily threat. If you For me, the, the biggest risk I would say is that um, people don't want to really talk about the things that they know. Um, uh, it's a, as you said, it's a very small country and, and if, you, if you know one, two people, you probably are connected to the, some few other peoples. And um, for the investigations that I did, I've, I've, I've spoken with a few people that knew probably more details of the stories that I covered, but they wouldn't go on record or they just seemed that um, yeah, it was just too risky for them. And that also s says a lot about how Mongolia sees itself, I guess. Like today I've, I went to the, to the protest for the uh, uh, Resist China Day um, and there were very few people who came to the pro protest and, and it's just a very disheartening th thing to see as uh, I know a lot of Mongolians have some hate towards Mong China and there's some xenophobia, but there's also Mongolians who think that what is happening in China to the inner Mongolians, to the ethnic Mongolians is a very wrong thing, but their voices are only on the, on the internet and it doesn't go beyond that. And, and seeing that how Mongolians don't really appreciate the truth or don't want to speak about it, that is probably the, the biggest risk than uh, being actually hurt or, or being like arrested or anything. It's just that if, thing, if things happen, not, not very few people will speak about it. And not many few people, even if they care, would want to speak about it. That is probably the biggest risk that Mongolia is facing is that I think what I'm saying is that Mongolia, Mongolian people, most of us have become numb in, in, a, in a certain way. Mm, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So rather than continue... Sorry, uh, you're, you're cutting off. From oh, sorry, can you, can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Can you repeat the question? So, um, rather, uh, read a bit from Anand's work. So, after this book was written, uh, Anand wrote another article for ProPublica, and I'll read a short excerpt from that. The Rocky Highlands. to the plumbing population of the world's largest sheep in the world, the Argali. This endangered species is beloved for its giant curving horns, which can run over six feet in length. On a hunting trip this resources from both the U.S. and Mongolia, which each sent security services to accompany the president's eldest son and grandson on the multi-day trip. It also thrust Trump Jr. directly into the con Mongolian trophy used the bighorn rams as a national treasure. The right to kill in our galley is controlled by an opaque permitting system that experts say is mostly based on money, connections, and politics. Trump Jr. received special treatment during his summer trip, according to records obtained by ProPublica, as well as interviews with people involved in the hunt. The Mongolian government granted Trump Jr. a coveted and rare permit to slay the It's unusual for permits to be issued after a hunter's stay. It was one of the only, it was one of only three permits to be issued in that hunting region, local records show. Afterward, Trump Jr. met privately with the country's president, Hofmo, uh, sorry, my Mongolian pronunciation is slow today, um, Hofma Jean Batulga, before departing the capital of Ulaanbaatar back to Is that right? A local government official in the region where Trump Jr. hunted the Argali and a former government official with knowledge of the meeting. It isn't clear what was discussed. Trump Jr. wouldn't answer questions about the meeting. Representatives for Baltulga haven't responded to questions or requests for comment. 
So Anand, I'm hoping that you can take us through what the process of what it takes to work on an, an in-depth piece of journal. This part by telling us how you got the idea, how you got in touch with ProPublica about it, and then through your journey out to buy an old to research it and the challenges that you faced in trying to connect the pieces of this puzzle. Um, yes, so I've first, I got, um, uh, well, basically I got a tip from uh, a friend of mine. Um, he's, a, he's an archaeologist, archaeologist, I think that's the proper term, uh, William Taylor. He, uh, he does a lot of uh, uh, archaeology work in Mongolia. Um, I've, I've, I first uh, interviewed him for a piece about uh, the icing, the melting, um, the melting ice in, uh, in, the, in the northern region, in the Tag region. And funny enough, well, we both were on the same flight to Germany and we sat together and we were just talking and he, and he talked about his uh, trip to um, Bayern Ulke. And I think during his trip to Bayern Ulke at, at that time was also where Donald Trump Jr. was, came to Bayern Ulke. It just occurred that time. And um, there was news, there was local news that that Donald Trump Jr. was just hiking the mountains of the, of the, Alta, the Great Alta Mountains. Uh, but he told me that he spoke with people there and then he actually hunted Argali and uh, and that was that was just basically the uh, the first initial spark or, or or have the lead I had and I just worked from there and and, and I contacted my uh, uh, contact from ProPublica and they were interested and then we started to work on, on the story and we start to um, research things on on previously what. What the laws were, and uh, and experts who who know about hunting argali or uh, or the preservation of argali and all that, yeah. And uh, so, and basically, what happened was that during that time investigation, uh, we were we were having a lot of dead ends because most of the time the the government officials were not really speaking to us and uh, we, we, requested, we requested information about the hunt. They didn't reply back. And, and the best thing was for me to do was to go to where Donald Trump Jr. went and speak with the locals. And sure enough, uh, I've, I found the people who orchestrated the, the hunt basically and, and they told me <laughs> all the gist. Um, so for, I know there are a lot of aspiring who might end up watching the discussion. Tell us more about how you got in touch with ProPublica and like, you know, what it's like to work with an international news organization like that. Oh, yes. So the first time I got in touch with ProPublica is actually thanks to uh, one person who was very avid like sociologist i could say uh, who who studies mongolia uh, you you probably know you you know him also julian Durkus. he introduced me to uh, uh, ian mcdougall and and we just start working from there And I see that Brian's put a question here. It says the State Department's 2019 Human Rights Report, Section 2, discusses respect for civil liberties, including freedom of expression in the press. Notes, according to a global international survey, 67% of journalists said they had experienced some form of threat or intimidation with their reporting at least once in their career. Yeah. So, yeah. Anand, maybe you can respond to that. I mean, Maybe you haven't been threatened personally, but I know, I mean, you're I, also I married to a journalist. Okay, so was, tell, us, was, tell us more about that. So it was actually after the uh, the release of the uh, Donald Trump Jr. Um, um, of investigation, actually. And uh, the, the person who who was the main guide, he, he threatened to sue me. And um, he, he didn't follow up, though. Um, 
most of the time, yeah, Mongolian, in Mongolia, there's a very hard hit. Mongolians are very hard. Mongolian journalists are very hard with, uh, with being sued. So most of the times, a lot of local newsrooms, they don't have much funding. They're very much like a very small business almost. And, and they wouldn't touch things that they might get into trouble. So they would not really go into big in-depth stories. And if they do, uh, and if they do, and what would happen is that they'll get sued. And, and if they get sued and, uh, and most of the time they cannot afford any, any lawyers to help, help fight their litigations. And what they end up doing is that they would just drop the story and just drop it all together. And sometimes some journalists who were just starting out or beginning to think like, okay, I'm going to do like a very hard hitting story. And what would happen is that they would do like a very um, expose story about some case like, uh, oh, this supermarket sells expired fruits or what ha have you. But they'd never really questioned the supermarket. They would really never went to the, to the, to the accused, so they would only get the source from the person who's accusing the supermarket, and they would get, get into a lot of troubles like that, and and because of that, uh, some journalists tend to uh, step their bounds of what they can do and what they can't do, and that those are, are some of the issues they have, and some journalists also don't don't think that. Some people who says that they're going to sue you or they're going to, they're going to do some kind of re repercussion, even if they did, do have their facts, all their facts together, that they get scared because they don't, uh, they don't know that they're protected by some laws. And most of the time, like some people would not follow through on, on the litigations. And, 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 mo and some of the times, it's, I think it's much more difficult for female journalists than male journalists, I would say. Because if you get threatened, uh, like if uh, I, I'm not a female, but I've I've heard like female get female journalists who got threatened, um, who they would they would get calls like, I know where you live, I know where your kid goes to school, and I know that you're single and all that. So I think that might scare a lot of female journalists to just drop the story or just maybe drop their career. At, all together and just don't pursue it and that's kind of a sad thing because most of the time the the best journalists the best people who the the, the best journalists in Mongolia are a, a female journalist in my perspective um, I know a lot of like I like I said good journalists um, they're mostly female they they know how to question people they know how to get the sources right and most of the time they would leave the careers because of threats that they have on, on, on the stories that we're following. Yeah, so I wanna open the conversation up to questions now. Um, I know Brian is on the line. Um, if you don't know Anand, Brian was the former ambassador to Mongolia and he's got, um, I think he's got quite a lot of questions um, for you today. So Brian, we welcome you if you wanna ask Anand some questions now. I'll be happy to answer. Can you hear me now, Anand? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Hi, Brian. Good morning. Well, good evening, I guess, to you. Yes. Um, the, and that, interestingly, was one of the great challenges. I, and um, by way of transparency, I wasn't the ambassador, the deputy ambassador or oh. deputy chief of mission. So Sorry, Brian. Um, no worries. Uh, it was a promotion. Um, I guess my, my focus is on, on what happens in these defamation, these libel and slander suits. Have, have you seen how these court cases actually transpire? No, like no. Uh, that, that's the thing. I don't have very much knowledge of. I just, I just have hearsay there, but I never, have, uh, and sometimes uh, I think there's, um, because there's litigations and lawsuits, they, they can't really say things. They cannot really reveal things outside of the court, I guess. So I, I wouldn't know much about inside the, the court from what happens. And I don't know if anyone who actually has gone, gone to court. 
because of defamation suits and, and all that. One of the things I noticed in um, in Aubrey's book was um, the growth in the number of um, of media outlets. Uh, yes. And when I was I lived there two thousand five to eight, and there were sort of a handful of newspapers and a handful of TV stations and social media was just sort of getting started at that point and there wasn't that there weren't that many people who had access to social media at the at that time that's all of that has changed according to what yes. uh, Aubrey's written in in her book um, most of those most of those media outlets uh, at that time looked like they were owned by individual families or individual yes. corporations and, and therefore um, reflected the views of that political that political player or that business person or or whoever has as the who owns it has that changed much in in your view no no uh, i think it actually expanded more uh, there's probably uh, now there's um some channels that are just one and two of this of the same channel and just it, it keeps expanding and sometimes it's uh it's the tv stations that also have uh, websites and um, social media uh, accounts and just and, and all just spreading out all, all throughout uh, to to every social sphere and I think the owners I think more people who've gotten rich throughout the years they they also probably got their own TV stations um, uh, news sites and all that and there's very few um, news sites that are, in my opinion, that are, that they are not biased or, or, yeah. Which ones that I do you think are independent, actually independent? Uh, for, Icon is one of, I think that's the, the number one um, media source that is independent. Um, what, what else is there? Uh, uh, Uruk, I think Uruk is independent. It's, it's just a, it's fairly new, um, but they've done very good journalism. The others are, to me, they've, they're kind of sketchy. Uh, it's even though they have really good um, journalists, they've. Uh, it's very hard to say they're independent at all. Uh, but there are some good journalists who work for corporate organizations like um, uh, there's one TV like um, um, interview show called um, Red Pen um, the journalist there he's, he's really he's really solid he, he has good questions he's always prepared and he, he knows a lot about human rights and he knows about the law he knows how to respect some of his guests and he and, and he does something that most Mongolian journalists that that don't do is that he follows up on his previous question. If uh, what happens in Mong Mongolia is that most journalists would just let the, the, the interviewee just speak their mind and just don't follow up on, on their initial question. If they ask about something about corruption, most journalists uh, and, and the interviewee just dodges and says something else. Most journalists would just leave it at be, but he really hammers it and and he questions the things that, um, that he wants answers to. Uh, yeah. Um. And then one of the things that we had to track fairly closely was um, yellow journalism or sensationalist journalism. Yes, yes. Um, and mostly that was to put out fires if there was a misinformation or disinformation being put out. Still happening? Yes, that's still happening. It hasn't changed much. I think, I think it, uh, I think it's much more rampant because of social media now. One of the um, one of the things I spent five years in Korea, two different times uh, in the mid '80s before democracy, and then again 2000, 2003, and um, the the journalists there were invariably sort of fresh out of college, uh, mm -hmm. underpaid, overworked. Um, mm -hmm. and really had to hustle in order to mm -hmm. get a story that for which they would get some, some notoriety and, and even pay in some cases. Mm -hmm. Is that the same similar kind of track in Mongolia? 
I think so. Um, so one thing for me, I, I would, I would not like, I, I'm very flattered that Aubrey would call me an investigative journalist, but um, to me, I would call myself as a, a jack of all trades journalist, as that, that I would like to do everything that I can, like do video, audio, and writing and editing, and all of those things. And I think that's, to me, is, is the future of journal journalism. And um, in Mongolia, what happens is that a lot of the times that most journalists or like journalists who, who's in front of the camera and who, who writes, those are the people who are just basically doing all of the all of their work, all of the work. And most of the people who are supposed to be helping them out or supposed to giving them leeway to, to do their work. And they, those people don't consider themselves as, as journalists, like the videographers or the editors or the uh, uh, newsroom managers. They don't see themselves as the entity of journalism or media. They, they just see themselves as like the cog that's supposed to be there or something. And what, what happens is that um, the journalists usually have to do all the brunt work and sometimes they would they would be because they have to do so much work and they don't get appreciation they, they tend to get, get into a loop where they just do the, the bare minimum and just grind those out and don't do any hard-hitting journal, journalism work and that's kind of sad because I've, I've seen some good journalists who 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 went into that track and just lost their ways and yeah and I think that's fairly the same here also where uh, they're they're still underpaid and but they also don't have much help within their community or within their um, like work sphere. Are there are there uh, programs that? Um, can help raise standards or help train journalists? I mean, I, I seem to recall that the U.S. Embassy did some of that, bringing um, trainers in to offer some um, uh, ideas about how uh, standards can be established and um, what, what it's, what's required for honesty and transparency and those kinds of things. But I, I would suspect that there are, the government may be providing that, universities may be providing not much, no, no, the, the government, I don't, I have, I'm not seeing the government do much. There's a, uh, I forgot what was it, the, the journalist union, but they barely did anything for journalists. The, the, the head of the, the, um, the journalist union, he, he went into a, a local party and he even uh, participated in the elections himself. And he promised a lot of things, but he never followed through any. And he, he was a, he was a bread, and butter example of, of sensational journalism and 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 there's other organizations who small organizations uh, like the media council international organization uh, with um, I'm, I'm forgetting my, the names but yeah there's some small organizations that uh, help journalists train and uh, train them and to give them more advanced tools to progress their uh, journalism in, in the modern way, like using social media, how to be more ethical, how to cover stories, and all that. Um, uh, yeah, and there's very little tool from, there's very little help from the government to help journalists. And most of the time, I see government trying to stifle um, media, and, and they think that media is, is their, um, uh, uh, like their messenger almost, like, like how um, like tyrannical organizations use media for their messaging. I think that's that's their still their message. And I I don't want to name names, but there's organizations, there are media organizations that are directly funded by the the government. They don't cover stories that are detrimental to the to the government in any way or, or shape or form. What about the press club, Anand, or? the the media council do they do any of that training yes yes so that yes that's what i was saying media council the press institute yes i just couldn't i just i just couldn't get the names out of my head <laughs> I, I think there's uh there are a number of um foreign 
press organizations like Bloomberg and some of the others that either have represent representatives on the ground or have stringers or or uh, associations or affiliations with maybe uh, some of the local organizations has has that had any impact on what Mongolians are doing? Uh, yes, uh, Bloomberg had a, a a big impact on on the, um, how, like broadcast media and m more of it. They they try to be more like like Bloomberg, how they're like very flashy and just. Uh, good camera work and all that. And uh, I think some media uh, uh, try to emulate th that in, in some way or form. And isn't the f one of the former owners, the former Mongolian owners of Bloomberg suing Icon because of the SME scandal stories? Uh, there was talks of that, but I don't know if, th if that even went through or not. Yeah, Bloomberg Mongolia is they just they just license their name, so they they're not actually a part of Bloomberg in any ways, and they're actually owned by one of the Mongolia's uh, biggest uh, uh, commercial banks. Interesting. Any yeah. other questions or follow up from from Brian or anyone else on the call? Nothing more for me. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Appreciate it. Thank you. And I wonder if you could share with us um, as, a, as a closing here, um, if there's anything that you're currently working on that you can share with us without blowing your story. Um, I'm, I'm doing a, I've done a story for Business Insider. I think you're in it also. I've, I've worked on it for, for three months and that should be out, I think this Friday. Uh, I don't know what time though, but it should be out on Friday on Facebook. And uh, one thing I'm also working on is uh, I'm, I'm, uh, is is basically the inner Mongolian ethnic Mongolians. I really want to do a few stories on that. I think that is a story that most people should hear about and. But uh, I've not found any publications that are quite interested in, in the in the angles I've, I've pitched to them so so far. So I'll I'll keep trying though. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today and keep pitching, keep trying <laughs> different stories on Mongolia too. And you know, I I I wouldn't consider myself a journalist so much, but I know how frustrating it can be. You know, when you have like this really important story about Mongolia and you're sending these pitches out and people are can bring it <laughs> tie it to China somehow or you yes, know, yes, can exactly. you they always, or, or they want you to exoticize it in some way. And so, you know, it's really hard to fight this battle of just reporting on Mongolia for Mongolia's sake. But I am glad that we're in this in this quest together and um, I'm grateful for your work and for your friendship. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank okay, you for having me Aubrey. So you bet. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Have a good evening or morning, wherever you are. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye.